Thank you for tuning in today. So what we've got today is Jim Butcher's Dresden Files, uh, Deadbeat, which is book seven of the Dresden Files. What we're on today is uh, chapter 19. So if you've missed the other chapters or the previous books, please do go look in their respective playlists down below. Also, <clears throat> please do make sure to go ahead and grab the book and read along with me. Um, and make sure to like, subscribe, and share this channel with your friends, family, or acquaintances, or whoever you meet. Please go ahead and share this. Let's go ahead and jump here into chapter 19. Marcone and company dropped me off a hundred yards from the emergency entrance to the hospital, and I had to hobble it alone. It was hard, and I was tired, but I'd been hurt worse before. It wasn't like I wanted to do this every day or anything, but after a certain point of ridiculous discomfort, the pain all feels pretty much the same. Once I made it to the emergency room, I was a big hit. When you drag yourself inside panting and leaving a trail of bloody footprints behind you, it makes a certain impression. I had an orderly and a nurse helping me onto my stomach on a gurney within a few seconds while the nurse examined the wound. This isn't life-threatening, she reported after she cut away my pant leg and took a look. She glanced at me almost in accusa accusation. From the way you came in here, you'd think this almost killed you. Well, I said, I'm kind of a wimp. Nasty, commented the burly orderly. He produced a clipboard layer in forms and a ballpoint pen and handed them both to me. They'll have to cut this out. We'll let the doctors decide that, said the nurse. How did this happen, sir? I have no clue, I said. I was walking down the street, and all of a sudden, I thought my leg was on fire. You walked here? she asked. A helpful Boy Scout brought me most of the way, I said. She sighed. Well, it's been a slow day. They should be able to see you shortly. That's super, I said, because it hurts like hell. I can get you some Tylenol, the nurse said primely. I don't have a headache. I have a four-inch piece of steel in my leg. She passed me a paper cup and two little white tablets. I sighed and took them. Heh, <laughs> the orderly said after she left. Don't worry too much. They'll get you something when the doctor sees to you. With this kind of loving care, I probably won't need it. Don't be too hard on her, the orderly said. You should see what people try so that they can get some painkillers, Vicodin, morphine, that kind of thing. Yeah, I said. Hey, man, can I ask you something? Sure. He had brought a bowl of ice cream with him, and he started sealing it into plastic bags, which he started packing around the leg. Did I say ice cream? I'm sorry, ice with him. He brought a bowl of ice with him and started sealing it into plastic bags, which he started packing around my leg. This should numb it a little, maybe take down some of the swelling. It ain't a local, but it's what I've got. The ice didn't actually burst into steam upon touching me, even though it felt like it should have. The pain didn't exactly lessen, but it did suddenly feel a little more distance. Thanks, man. Hey, I was hoping I could talk to a couple of guys I know while I was here, I said. They're EMTs. Gary Simmons and uh, Jason Lamar? The orderly lifted his eyes. Simmons and Lamar? Sure, they drive an ambulance. I know. Are they around? They were on shift last night, he said. But it's the end of the month, and they might be on their swing shift. I'll ask. I appreciate it, I said. If Simmons is there, tell him a school buddy is here. Sure. If I do that, though, you got to do something for me and fill out these forms. I eyed the clipboard and picked up the pen. Tell the doc to sign me up for carpal tunnel surgery when he gets that thing out of me. Two birds with one stone, the orderly grinned. I'll do that. He left me to fill in the forms, which didn't used to take terribly long to fill out since I didn't have any kind of insurance. One of these days, when I had the money, I was going to have to get some. They say that when you pay for insurance, you're really buying peace of mind. It might make me feel peaceful to think 
of how much money the company was probably going to lose on me in the long run. If I lived my whole life in the open, I had been <clears throat> as I had been since I'd come to Chicago, they might be dealing with me for two or three centuries. I wondered what the yearly markup would be for 250 year old. A young doctor came in after I was finished with the forms, and true to the orderly's prediction, he had to cut the shuriken out of me. I got a local, and the sudden sensation of pain was like a drug all by itself. I fell asleep while he was cutting and woke up as he was wrapping my leg up. The suture's dry, he was saying, through the looks of your file, I suppose you know that. Sure, Doc, I said. I know the drill. Do you need to take them out, or did I get the other kind? They'll dissolve, he said. But if you experience any swelling or fever, get in touch. I'm giving you a prescription for something for the pain and some antibiotics. Follow all the printed instructions and be sure to take them all, I said, in my best Surgeon General slash television announcer voice. Looks like you've done this as often as I have, he said. He gestured to the steel tray where the bloodied shuriken lay. Did you want to keep the weapon? Might as well. I have to get a souvenir in the gift shop otherwise. You sure you don't want the police to look at it? He said. They might be able to find fingerprints or something. I already told you guys, it must have been some kind of accident, I said. He gave me a look of extreme skepticism. All right. If that's the way you want it. He dropped the little weapon into a middle metal tray of alcohol or some other sterilizer. Keep your leg elevated. That will ease the swelling. Stay off of it for a couple of days at least. No problem, I said. He shook his head. The orderly will be in in a minute with your prescriptions and a form to sign. He departed. He departed. A minute later, there were footsteps outside the little alcove they'd put me in, and a large young man drew the curtain aside. He had skin almost as dark as le my leather duster, and his hair had been cropped into a flat top so precise that his barber must have used a level. And he was on the heavy side. Not out of shape, or ripped out, but simply large and comfortable with it. He wore an EMT's jacket and a name tag on it that read Lamar. He stood there looking at me for a minute and then said, You're the wrong killer to have been at my high school and I didn't go to college. Army medic, I asked. Navy. Marines. He folded his arms. What do you want? My name's Harry Dresden, I said. He shrugged. But what do you want? I sat up. My leg was still blissfully numb. I wanted to talk to you about last night. He eyed me warily. What about it? You were on the team who responded to a gunshot victim on Walker. His breath left him in a long exhale. He looked up and down the row, then stepped into a little alcove and closed the curtain behind him. He lowered his voice. So? So I want you to tell me about it, I said. He shook his head. Look, I want to keep my job. I lowered my voice as well. You think telling me is going to endanger that? Maybe, he said. He pulled open his jacket and then unbuttoned two buttons on his shirt. He opened it enough to show me a Cavalier vest beneath that. See that? EMTs have to wear them around here, because people shoot at us sometimes. Gangbangers, that kind of thing. We show up, try to save lives, and people shoot at us. Must be tough, I said cautiously. He shook his head, I can handle it. But a lot of people don't. And if it looks like you're starting to crack under the pressure, they pull you out. Word gets around that I'm telling fairy tales about things I've seen. They'll have me in the psychiatric disability by tomorrow. He turned to go. Wait, I said. I touched his arm lightly. I didn't grab him. You don't go unexpectedly grabbing former Marines if you want your fingers to stay in the same shape. Look, Mr. Lamar, I just want to hear about it. I'm not going to repeat it to anyone. I'm not a reporter or... He paused. You're the wizard he said. Saw you on Larry Fowler once. People say you're crazy. Yeah, I said. So it isn't as if they'd believe me, even if I did talk about you. 
which I won't. You're the one they arrested in the nursery a few years back, he said. You broke in during a blackout. They found you in the middle of a wrecked room with all those babies. I took a deep breath. Yeah. Lamar was silent for a second. Then he said, You know that the year before, the SIDS rate there was the highest in the nation. They averaged one case every ten days. No one could explain it. I didn't know that, I said. Since they arrested you there, they haven't lost a single one, he said. He turned back to me. You did something. Yeah. Do you like ghost stories? He snorted out a breath through his nose. I don't like any of this crap, man. Why do you want me to tell you what I saw? Because what you know might help me keep more people from getting hurt. He nodded, frowning. All right. He said after a moment, but I'm not saying this right now, you understand me? I'm not going to say this again to anyone. Only reason I tell you is that you helped those babies. I nodded. He sat down on the edge of the gunnery. Or er, gurney. <clears throat> we got the call around midnight. Headed over to Wacker. The cops were there already. Found this guy on the street, all busted up. Two hits in the chest and two in the abdomen. He was bleeding bad. I nodded, listening. We tried to stabilize him, but there wasn't much point to it. Simmons and me both knew that, but we tried. It's what you do, you know. He was awake for it, scared as hell, screaming some... Uh, kept bugging us not to let him die. Said that he had a little girl he had to look after. What happened? He died, Lamar said, his voice flat. I've seen it before, here in town, in action while I was in the Corps. You get to where you can recognize death when he comes knocking. He rubbed his large, rather slender hands together. We tried to resuscitate, but he was gone. That's when it happened. Go on. This woman shows up. I don't know from where. We just looked up, and she was standing over us, looking down. I leaned forward. What did she look like? I don't know, Lamar answered. She was, like, wearing this costume, right? Like those people at the Renaissance fairs? Big old black robe with a hood over her head? I didn't see much of her face, just her chin and throat. She was white. What did you do? I figured she was a nut. You get them a lot this time of year. Or maybe going to a costume party or something. Hell, it's almost Halloween. She looks at me and tells me to back up and let her help him. How many women in black hooded robe could have been running around town last night? Kamori? That would have been maybe 45 minutes or an hour before I saw her at Box. Lamar peered at my face. You know her? He said. Not personally, but yeah. What did she do? His face grew more remote. She knelt down over him, like straddling the stretcher. Then she leaned down. The robe and hood fell over them both, right? Like I couldn't see what she was doing. He licked his lips, and it got cold. I mean, ice started forming on the sidewalk, and the stretcher, and on our truck. I swear to you, ice. It happened. I believe it, I said. And the victim all of a sudden starts coughing, trying to scream. I mean, it was like the wounds were gone, but I don't know how to describe it. He was holding on. His face twisted with a sickening expression. He was in agony. And he was stable. It was like, like he wasn't being allowed to die. So the woman stands up. She tells us that we've got less and she's gone. Like, poof, gone. Like she was all in my imagination, man. I shook my head. Then, we brought him in. The docs patched him up and got fresh blood into him. He passed out about an hour later. But he made it. Lamar was silent for a long moment. That couldn't have happened, he said then. I mean, I've seen people pull through some bad stuff, but not like that. He should have been dead. Everything I know tells me so. But he kept going. Sometimes miracles happen, I said quietly. He shrugged. This wasn't a miracle. There wasn't any angel choir singing. 
My skin tried to crawl away and hide. He shook his head. I don't want to think about it. What about your partner? I asked. He drank himself under the table 20 minutes after our shift ended. Hell, only reason I wasn't with him was that I was teaching a CPR class this morning. He looked at me. Does that help? It might, I said. Thank you. Sure. What are you going to do now? I asked. Gonna go find my own table. Lamar stood up and said, Good luck, man. Thanks. The big man left, and while I got my prescriptions and filled out the last forms, I thought about what he'd had to say. I got the prescriptions filled at the hospital pharmacy, called a cab, and told him to take me to Mike's to pick up the Blue Beetle. I sat in the back seat of my eyes closed and thought about what I'd learned. Kamori had saved the gunshot victim's life. If everything Lamar had said was accurate, it meant that she had gone out of her way to do it. And whatever she'd done, it had been an extremely difficult working to leave a mystic impression as intense as it did. That might explain why Kamori had done very little during the altercation with Cowell. I had expected her to be nearly as strong as her partner, but when she tried to take the book from me, her power hadn't been stronger than my own muscles and limbs. But the Kemlar Alumni Association was in town with some vicious competition in mind. Why would Kamori have expended her strength for a stranger, rather than saving it for battling rival necromancers? Could the shooting victim have been important to her plans in some way? It didn't track. The victim was just one more thug for the outfit and he certainly wasn't going to be doing anything useful from his bed in intensive care. I had to consider the possibility that she'd been trying to do the right thing, using her power to help someone in dire need. The thought made me uncomfortable as hell. I knew that the necromancers I'd met were deadly dangerous, and if I wanted to survive a conflict with them, I would have to be ready to hit them fast and hard and without any doubts. That was easy enough when the enemy is a frothing, psychotic monster. But Kamari's apparent humanitarian act changed things. It made her a person. And people are a hell of a lot harder for me to think about killing. Even worse, if she'd been acting altruistically, it would mean that the dark energy the necromancers seemed to favor might not be something wholly, inherently evil. It had been used to preserve life, just as the magic I knew could be used either to protect or to destroy. I had always considered the line between black magic and white to be sharp and clear, but if that dark power could be employed in whatever fashion its wielders chose, it might be no different from my own. Damn it. Investigation was supposed to make me certain of what needed to be done. It was supposed to conf not confuse me even more. When I opened my eyes, thick clouds had covered the sun and painted the whole world in shades of gray. Thank you for listening to Chapter 19 of the Dresden Files, uh, Deadbeat Book 7. Please hope you... <clears throat> I hope you had time to like, subscribe, and share my uh, reading of the book, and you were able to read along with me. I do want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to listen to this with me, and you have a wonderful and blessed day.